Strasvitsa, and welcome back to the Russian Football News Podcast. The RPL takes a back seat this weekend as international football returns. However, first up here at RFN, we'll be discussing the one-all draw between Spartak Moscow and Zenit St. Petersburg on Saturday evening, before moving on to Spornaya's Nation League games, and finishing off with the all-new RFN mailbag as we answer some of your questions. Joining me this week once again is Richard Pike. Good evening, everybody. How are we going? I'm not too bad, because this week we've got the... The return from the snow-filled depths of Siberia, Andrew Flint. <laughs> oh, I'm back. I've missed it. I've missed it. Great to be back on, guys. Yeah, it's great to get you back. And it's good timing as well, because the first port of call in this week has to be, of course, Spartak versus Zenit, which took place at the Otkritia Arena on Saturday night. So to quickly just run through the events of the game, the opening exchanges were quite a tight affair as Spartak had the majority of the possession. Within the first five minutes, both Andrei Mostovoy and Roman Zovnin forced saves from either keeper. And Spartak themselves were actually aggrieved not to have been awarded a penalty after Day and Lovren seemed to push Ostor Nurinov in the box. Towards the mid point of the second half, Zenit began to turn the screw and forced a host of solid saves from Spartak keeper Alexander Maximenko, the best of which was a pair of stunning reflex saves from Zuba and Yerakin. The home side saw more of the ball, but could not create much from it. The Zenit's back line were notoriously miserly and the only shots were really from the edge of the area and particularly Ezekiel Ponsa came closest with one that whispered just past the post. Despite the big game being scoreless at 0-0, it was a far cry from the snooze fest earlier in the day for Ufa versus Rotter. In the second half, Spartak began to dominate. Before the hour mark, they missed two massive chances with both Larson and Ponsa, hear that name again soon, firing over one-on-one with Mikhail Kershikov. The old adage that if you don't take your chances, you will then concede. Well, that came true into 10 minutes later, just after Jordan Larson's miss, when Zenit took the, league, took the lead. Alex Kral was dispossessed by Magomed Ozdoyev, who found Mostovoy, and then in turn Douglas Santos. The fullback crossed to the back post, inch perfect onto the massive head of the awaiting Zuba, who headed it back across goal for Yerikin to volley in from close range. From this moment on, Spartak dominated the ball, but Zenit did worry them on the counter once or try, twice, especially for Vyacheslav Karavaya, who dragged wide after beating the offside trap. With 10 minutes to go, Sanya Sobolev won a corner for Spartak. Jordan Larson found Ponsa perfectly, but his header bounced back off the right stanchion and straight back into his path as he inexplicably sent the ball over from just two yards out with a net at his mercy. But Spartak did eventually level with just five minutes to go. Somehow, Alex Kral avoided a nosebleed from altitude sickness and found himself with the ball of foot in Zenit's box. He showed a deft close control of footwork to skim past Barrios and Douglas Santos to set up that man Ponsa who finally redeemed himself for his earlier misses. The game finished a pretty much fair and close 1-1. Neither team would be happy with it, but right now, with this early stage in the season, prefer to avoid defeat at all costs. So, the title fight is on. Richard, what were your general thoughts on the game and did anyone impress you in particular? I mean, what I will say is, is that um, when Alex Alex Kral's, um, you know, that run that set up the goal was, was absolutely brilliant. Um, uh, that run for Ponce's goal, and it was nice, calm and composed finish too. Um, I think 100% um, Alexander Maximenko really impressed for um, for Spartak in that game. So many good saves that he made, and we'll get on to that later. Um, but yeah, um, I think I think one one was a fair reflection. Uh, well, maybe maybe not. Maybe Zenit slightly would a better would a better team. I think a fair honest assessment of the game was was that um, was that Zenit created more chances. Than, uh, than Spartak did, but Spartak created the better ones. Um, so perhaps Zenit edged it, but um, Spartak, I don't think we'll be too disappointed with the 1-1. Um, I mean, as for Zenit, I think Artem Zuba had a good game once again. Um, his depth play off for Yadokin to stroke home um, was a um, classic, um, classic example of how he plays the complete forward role um, in the team. Uh, and other elements of his all-round game were quite good. Um, but yeah, one thing that's definitely noticeable to take out of the game is um, Spartak's improvement on the Tedesco. Um, it's coming up to a year now since he was appointed uh, the new manager. 
Dominic Otedesco. And it's taken a little bit of time uh, for him to get his philosophies set in stone. However, they are now set. And um, Spartak, I do think, now are ready to challenge for not only second and Champions League qualification this season, but also possibly for a title. Um, possibly to challenge the need for the title. Uh, the most important signing now that Spartak needs to do in the next few weeks is get Domenico Tedesco signed up to a new contract. And I would literally know if I was Shamil Gazizov and the board um, beg him to stay because he's making um, a big, uh, massive difference to um, to Spartak compared to last year. You know, it, it's chalk and cheese. Um, from Zenit's point of view, um, looking at uh, obviously they've made a, a big, big name um, signing uh, this week in v- Wendell from um, Sporting Lisbon. Um, I thought it was quite funny when um, Sergei Simak said that you know, oh, we'll just count on no more foreign signings. There'll probably be another. That a domestic player that will sign. I thought that was complete rubbish when two days later they were being linked with two um, foreign playmakers. I think one of them being Rodrigo de Paul. Um, so, yeah, um, very interesting to see where they fit Wendell into the team. I think they have needed a playmaker for a while. Um, and obviously, the Champions League games are coming up too thick and fast. I suspect there'll be a slight formation change to 4 1, uh, 4 3 1 2 with Wendell playing in a three with Barrios and um, Ozdoyev and then Malcolm given a free roll behind the two forwards. I honestly think that's what they'll do um, to accommodate all those players. Um, I also read when Bruno Fernandes left Sporting that Mendel took on extra responsibility. So um, maybe they might not use him deep. I'm convinced they use him as a playmaker. They've already got two deep midfielders. They won't sign a third one. So I'm convinced he's going to be the playmaking um, player in that midfield or the create more creative player. Um, so, so, yeah. Yeah. Um, Whisper it quietly, everybody, but we might well have a title race based on that game um, in the Akriti Arena. Whisper it quietly. But yeah, I think one big advantage that Spartak do have is the fact that um, they've got no European football. That's a huge advantage. Remember Liverpool back in 2013-14 in the Premier League, no European football does make a difference. And um, I have just a funny feeling that um, Spartak are going to be up there this season. It's definitely going to be closer from what I'm seeing so far. Yeah, definitely. I, I have to echo all of those thoughts and... On Tedesco in particular, I, I definitely agree. They they need to get him down to a new a new deal. At first, he was from the outside looking in a little bit of a joke character, where people questioned his fiery antics, and it's quite clear that that's exactly what they are. They are antics. Off the pitch, he's he's a very thoughtful and caring man. In interviews, he's not fiery whatsoever. He's actually very calm and collected. It just he, he does the old Alex Ferguson trick where he puts all of the limelight and pressure onto himself, and therefore. Brings it, takes it away from his players, and it's an old trick in the book, but it works very, very well. And obviously, when he signed, he only did sign an, an eighteen-month contract. So, that, so Spartak definitely need to get him on a on a new deal, pretty sharpish. Now, Zenit themselves have actually dominated this fixture in recent years. Uh, they're now including Saturday's game and beaten in four. Before that, they had previously won three in a row. And Spartak now haven't registered a clean sheet at all in the last f- last five games against Zenit. So, Andrew, is this Spartak finally being able to match the high-flying rivals, as Richard suggested? Could we be yeah. in for a Zenit Spartak title fight and the first time that feels like forever? I, I think absolutely. And I, the thing about uh, Tedesco, it always confused me at the beginning. I think Richard made a really, really good point that they need to time down to a contract as soon as they can um, because it always felt strange when he, the original deal was so short, what, about 18 months or whatever it was. And that signed that signaled to me that Tedesco perhaps wasn't entirely sure this was going to be much. More. He would just dip his toe in the water. If he didn't like it, he'd be off. But he's shown so much passion and commitment to the side. And the, you mentioned the antics. I, I think you're absolutely spot on with that. I think it's worked brilliantly. And for such a young person to show, you know, in a managerial sense at least, um, to show that sort of awareness of what he needs to do in a club of this sort of character and size where you just simply cannot fly under the radar and they're doing the opposite and I, I was particularly impressed really um, in March in the derby against Dinamo um, at the VTB or whatever name you choose to use for that stadium that Dinamo Moscow use um, and Spartak completely outplayed Dinamo and his tactics were absolutely spot on and that, for me, was a sign of thought, you know what, Spartak might be able to do something here. This season, they're looking good. And I think that their options are decent. They could perhaps do with a little bit more depth in defence. But other than that, I think Spartak's squad is very, very well balanced. And potentially, we really could have an actual title race. 
can I just uh, come yeah. in there, guys? Can I just sorry, can I just come in there, guys, as well? I look at it this way with a new contract for Tedesco too. If he was to go back to Germany, it's only really worth going back to Germany at, at one of the decent sized clubs who can qualify for Europe. Because let's say, for example, a random German job like I don't know, maybe um, Bielefeld came available. I don't see the point in leaving Spartak to go to Bielefeld. If it was someone ambitious like Hertha Berlin or one of the bigger clubs, Leverkusen, etc., fair enough. But, you know, it's pointless. Spartak have way more potential. They can qualify for Europe frequently. Bielefeld can't. So I think, yeah, they would do well to get him onto a new deal because they can sell the thing. Spartak are, gives you much more a chance to play in Europe quicker and get back to that level because he played there with Schalke before. So, yeah, I'd definitely get into a new... Echo both your thoughts. Get him onto a new contract, please. Yeah, absolutely. And to be honest, I was a little bit surprised at the work that he has done at Spartak. It's clear that there is a, for once, uh, I must admit, the first time in a very long time, there's, there seems to be a long-term plan in place here. And it's not just flitting from manager to manager, hopefully. Hopefully not. And the first sign in that would be to get him on, on that new deal. Now, one of the players who made his debut before Tedesco came in was Alexander Maximenka. And he was rightly awarded his man of the match after a series of brilliant saves that kept the game at 0-0 in the first half, to be frank. He, he saved Spartak on numerous times. Now, he overcame some big game nerves to, that tend to creep in. He's made quite high-profile mistakes in the Siska derby twice against Loco, against Dinamo, with the, the, the famous 40-yard Vladimir Rikov shot, which he... He palmed into his own net, which was actually the first goal that he conceded in Spartak Colours. Now, Maximenka is clearly a very talented goalkeeper. That that much is self-evident. But Maxi, as us Spartak fans affectionately call him, is prone to that odd howler. Now, I think on his day, he is the best young Russian keeper ahead of Matvey Sof- Safanov, who, as of late, has also been prone to the odd mistake. Is this perhaps a little bit of lack of experience? So... Richard, do you think that he is perhaps the long-term successor to Igor Akinfeyev's crown for Sponaya? I think of both, um, in terms of both Safonov and Maximenko, I think Maximenko is the one I prefer, based on what I've um, seen of him so far. Uh, his performance last weekend was fantastic. It was a real performance of maturity from him too. We knew before uh, the game that he obviously had talent. We'd obviously, However, we had obviously seen the mistakes as well. But one thing I will say that was um, noteworthy in, in such a big game we had to be called upon, uh, Maximenko um, delivered superbly. Um, I honestly cannot recall him in that game making a mistake. Um, I can't recall him putting a foot wrong. You know, he looked confident and sure when he came for crosses and corners, and he also showed great reflexes on several occasions to keep Zenit at bay. Um, I do, yes, believe that he's the eventual successor to Igor Akinfeyev with the national team. And if Maximenko keeps performing to a high level, then he could even put himself short term in contention for the Euro 2021 squad. And, well, yeah, most certainly beyond that, uh, should they qualify, of course, for the 2022 World Cup, I think, yeah, Maximenko could, could be number one for Sporna then in Qatar. Um, he's still young at 22. Um, there's still going to be mistakes. He's still developing. He's still growing. But um, they'll gradually disappear with time, with the looks of it. I'm really impressed with his ceiling. And, yeah, I think you will see a very good talent emerge. So, yeah, definitely I feel he's in, he potentially is Sporna's future number one. Yeah, and it is worth noting that Maximenko is currently actually the under-21s number two behind Safanov, but I think a large reason of that is because of these few high-profile mistakes in recent times. And, and look, the Mikhail Galaktionov, who's the under-21s manager, is quite conservative. And from a person personal point, point, point of view, he's, he doesn't like to bring younger lads in early too often. He doesn't like to constantly play those who are under fire. Fyodor Chalov is clearly the under-21's first try striker. When he was underperforming before the COVID break, he was brought out of the limelight. He wasn't actually playing for the under-21s. When out of <laughs> when he, a lot of people were actually calling for him before that to be called up for the first team. So he's he's notoriously slightly conservative in that aspect. And I think I agree. It's a lot. It's it's inevitable that Maximenko will take over at some point, not just from under-21s but the first team as well. Now, this match, oh, in, a, in what's a, a horrendous turn of events for the first time this year, has no longer been marketed as El Klasikov, which, to be honest, is a little bit cringe and it's a little bit too on the nose to El Clasico. <laughs> Something more original needs to be created. But it's fine. It's, it's OK. I can understand it. Now, what it needs to be is certainly not the hashtag win line derby. <laughs> Jesus. Jesus. <laughs> now... 
I understand Winlion is a major sponsor of each side. It's on both shirts and on, on St. It's arm and on Spartak's like shouldery bit above the badges. But more sponsorship money into the league where sponsorship money is minuscule is not a bad thing. But come on, it's just corporate marketing it is a nightmare. Winline Derby needs binned off as soon as possible. <laughs> I remember once there was a, there's an old old historical adage, old aphorism that uh, Trotsky once told his former Menshevik comrades in 1917 that he would consign them to the dustbin lid of history. So let's make a bit of room in that and add Winline Derby to the dustbin lid of history. <laughs> so Andrew, what do you think of this new moniker? Well, I, I don't think anybody in history has ever put Trotsky, the Mensheviks, and Winline in one dustbin together. But I agree, it would make um, it would make quite an interesting collection for the the, the bin man, wouldn't it? Uh, it's just horrendous. It's it's absolutely horrendous, really. Um, I think the okay. Look, what if we're being serious for a moment though? You mentioned about the sponsorship deals. The amount of money that comes into the Russian game is still not nearly enough to compete with. With basically a lot of second tier European leagues. So let's be honest, there's the top five leagues who get a huge amount of income, but even the sponsorship money for, you know, the Liga Nos, um, you know, the Eredivisie, and even, I don't know about the Turkish league in particular, but I would imagine it's probably more than the Russian league. So almost anything I would take, but I think this is a line I would draw. I would find other things to sponsor. Sponsor the program, sponsor the team boss for the match day, anything. Just it, things that don't really matter in reality, um, are because I don't really see how much, what a price you can put on that. Because it's it's something that media outlets will pick up, like we have. But really, are any fans going to use it? Is it going to take off? Of course, it's not going to take off. People are going to ignore it or laugh at it at best. Um, but I suppose, in a way, any any press is is good press, so they will take whatever they can get. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, let's not use it too much in all seriousness. Yeah, indeed, so indeed. Indeed. yeah, on that sponsorship line with with the other sort of Group B leagues, if you would anachronistically call them that, is generally what tends to happen is if they have more, to, if it if it's shown on more television sets across the world, generally the more money that that comes in. Russia is the only shown in four countries across Europe. Never mind elsewhere that's the biggest issue here is the lack of sponsorship money but look let's not, let's not just let, let's just not okay Let, let's not call it win line derby ever again thank you very much for uh, as i need to the history it. box consigned to the history <laughs> box <laughs> yes without a shadow of a doubt and even then spartak fans were right rightly aggrieved that it was even being called derby in the first place i've never heard of derby which is a five to six hour train and 600 kilometer bloody distance before but Anyway, the the last little note on the match at the weekend, Spartak are actually set to be potentially reprimanded for violating some coronavirus regulations. So the attendance of the game was clearly well above 50%, if anyone can could see, had eyes to, to watch the match. You could see it was well over 50%. Social distancing was at a minimum. And uh, in, in, in the fan sectors in particular. Now, the latter of which we have seen in venues across the RPL both this season and last season when there was only 10% of fans in the ground. The fan sectors are not socially distanced. They never will be. The authorities, to be frank, can't really do much about it because the ultras never listen to anybody. It's as simple as that. It's one of those matters where it shouldn't happen. It's a disgrace that it does happen, but nothing will be done about it. And there's very little that could be done about it apart from a ban. So... Looking at official attendance figures, it was reported at over just over 17,000 at the Otclitia, which is well under, well under the 50% maximum imposed from the 1st of August. But sources have claimed to champion that, that the true figure is known by the club and is well over 50%. It's just been buried under. Now, depends which source you believe would say that they know it or not. Regardless, the local health authorities instigated proceedings by appealing to the courts and there is currently an administrative case being opened against Bartak for the breaches. Now, it's only in the opening processes and the resulting reprimand could vary with an upper monetary limit of a fine of 500,000 rubles and an upper physical limit of a 90-day closure of the stadium. Now, the RPL president, Sergei Pliadkin, did release a statement in support of Spartak and he claims that a closure is not necessary, but it is out of his hands. So we'll we'll keep an eye on this one because the cases will be heard on the 12th of October 
at the Tushinsky District Court in Moscow. Uh, Andrew, do you want to add, add much onto this one at the end? Just It's just mind-boggling that these social distancing isn't being adhered to, I think. Well, the, the, the thing is, I, I don't know exactly what number we're going to find out or whether we ever will find out the exact attendance in the ground, but it's almost irrelevant for me because you can say 10%, even when it was 10% attendance, social distancing was still not adhered to. And I'm talking even uh, when, I, when I went to watch the first game of the season uh, in Yekaterinburg, and there really were far fewer than half, but the ultra groups in virtually every ground in the whole league are grouped together like ultras like to do. And and it makes a mockery of the whole point of limiting the number of fans into the stadium in the first place. It doesn't matter if you've got one group gathered together or you've got the entire stadium gathered together. Social distancing is not being adhered to. Those fans will travel. And that's the entire point of limiting fans in the first place. So if they're going to limit the percent of capacity allowed in, they have to enforce social distancing. If they're not able to do that, they have to say no fans or just say, well, OK, let everybody in. What they're doing at the moment is just a contradiction in terms if they're not enforcing it. And uh, it just makes a mockery of the whole thing at the moment. Yeah, absolutely. I echo that entirely again once again. And if we want to move on to slightly happier and less controversial measures, the international break now returns this weekend as the RPL takes a backseat. So there's three games during the break in which Sweden, at the time of recording, have just beaten Russia at the, in a friendly at the VEB arena. We'll get more onto that in a second. And then in the two Nations League games are due to come, uh, first at home to Turkey on Sunday, and then at home to Hungary on Wednesday, both at the VTB arena. Now, I found out a little fun fact today, doing a little bit of research in the VTB arena as a, I'm a bit of a stadium nerd. Now, interestingly, the VTB actually has five officially unofficial names. So the full official name is the <laughs> VTB Arena Dino Central Stadium, which, as we can all agree, the VTB Arena Dino Central Stadium is quite a verbose and wordy name. So It's a mouthful. <laughs> <laughs> the ice hockey arena section is the VTB Arena. And then the football stadium section, of course, for those who might not know, the, there's two in one, is the Dino Central Stadium section. But then they are which is it is actually written down in the RFS and Dinamo's website as what I believe translates to colloquially officially or officially unofficially known separately as the Arkady Chernyshev Arena in hockey, which is a, a HC Dinamo uh, legend, and then the Lev Yashin Stadium in the football end, which needs no explanation. So there's five <laughs> names for one stadium, which I think Andrew put that perfectly pre-pod in a little just quick discussion that it's the most Russian or Soviet thing you'll ever hear in your life. But anyway, the squad for the for these three games is as follows. Uh, in goal, we've got Guillaume, Zhenayev and Chunin. Uh, the defenders are Zhikia, Kalavayev, Kutlyashov, Kutepov, Petrov, uh, Alexander Zhirov, a new name, more on him later. Uh, Semyonov and Mario Fernandez. Midfield, uh, Bakayev, Zobnin, Gazinski, Fomin. Cherishev, uh, Antoshka Miranchuk, Zhekov, Mostovoy, Ostoyev, Ianov, Kozyayev, and then up front is Sobolev, Smolov, and Zuba. But since the squad was announced, Sergei Petrov and Fedya Smolov have both withdrew through injury. They were respectively replaced by Smolny and uh, Nikolai Komlachenko. And then again, after that, Guillaume and, uh, Guillaume and Georges Nichikia have been isolated from the rest of the group, having undergone inconclusive COVID-19 tests. And according to rumours on Wednesday, had withdrew from the squad and neither were, of course, on the bench tonight against Sweden. Now, the big surprise inclusion, which we must have to address first, is the, uh, that of Alexander Zhirov, who's had quite an odd career. Now, he's, just, he's a central defender who's played for Angie and Yensei in the RPL. Uh, while Angie actually signed for Krasnodar and then was immediately loaned back, he didn't make a single appearance for the Bulls and moved abroad to Sandhausen in Germany in 2018. Uh, but before he even played for the RPL, in the RPL, sorry, he, he was given a rare call-up to the Spornaya squad by Fabio Capello way back in March 2015 while playing for Volgar Astrakhan in the Fena L. Now, he didn't make the final squad, and he's been one of them, the more impressive defenders in the two Bundesliga this season, 
and thus has been heavily linked to the one Bundesliga, uh, moves to Hannover 96, so the big club in that division in the two, and then also more recently links back to potentially going to the RPL. So Richard, that one came right out of the blue. Yes, it certainly did come right out of the blue, didn't it? Um, however, he has, after his move to Germany uh, in 2018, established himself as you know a key player for Sandhausen. I think they've They've become a very um, solid mid-table club in the second tier after coming up from the third tier. I'm not sure how long ago it was, but they've been in the second tier now about eight years or so, I think. Um, he only missed one game for them last season, actually, in the German second tier. He played 33 games out of 34, and in each of those 33 games, he played every single minute. Uh, he recorded one goal and one assist. Um, and yeah, as you said, he's now getting linked to um, Bundesliga 1 clubs or top Bundesliga 2 clubs. Um I mean, this call-up, it did come out of the blue, yes. However, you cannot say that, you know, based on his form for Sandhausen, just based on what we've been hearing, that he doesn't deserve it. Um, the way he's gone to Germany to rebuild his career in such an impressive fashion is worthy of um, high praise. And um, Church of has recognised that. As for the links to transfers in the future, yeah, I think if I was him, if he's enjoying it there in Germany, then I would probably try and stay there if he can. If someone like Hanover... You know, I'd imagine a decent bet for promotion back to the one Bundesliga or Hamburg, someone like that, or even a lower one Bundesliga team uh, in the January transfer market who, you know, are in need of a central defender comes in for him. 100% I would look to stay in Germany. Um, he's only 29. And in my opinion, if you can play in a high level of championship like the Bundesliga for possibly another two or three years before then eventually returning to Russia to finish your career in the um, RPL, then then why not? Yeah, certainly. The, the refreshing thing about this call-up for me is that he... It, it's just that. It's refreshing. It, it's Stanley Ch- uh, Chichesov has be, came under fire from ourselves in the past and other parts of the Russian media for being very predictable with selections, picking the same players despite not actually having a call-up at the time. I mean, because Yaev, in the last, the last uh, selection, didn't have a club. He only just signed for Zenit after he was announced that he signed that he that he was called up for the second selection of the season. Now, obviously Chichesov does have knowledge of Germany, um playing for Dinamo Dresden in the nineties and then playing in Austria, just not far from Germany. He's, he's managed there around the area. He's got good knowledge of Central Europe. So it's it, it makes sense that he's keeping an eye on this on this player, but obviously with the uh, Shikiero injured, a few retirees of late and then the some of the other Russian centre backs, shall we say, having zero defensive ability whatsoever, it's absolutely worth the go out of the blue, and hopefully Zhirov can kick on from here and perhaps get a move to the RPL or even better, a move into the Bundesliga, which would be great for the for the for the Russian league in general. Now, mentioning horrific defending because of the timing of the podcast, we'll we'll have to bypass the Sweden match now. We'll quickly just run through the events of that. Um, it's worth noting that four RPL players were included in Sweden's squad, including uh, Jordan Larsson, Karl Starfelt, Victor Klaassen and Marcus Berg. The first two started against Bonaya, and then Klaassen came on as a late sub. Uh, the game finished 2-1 to Sweden, thanks to some typically comical defensive work from Ilya Kutupov, who completely missed his marker from a cross-in from former Southern player Seb Larsson, good man Seb Larsson. And then Soslan Janayev, caught in no man's land, came out, completely misjudged the flight of the ball, and Alexander Isak had an easy header into the goal. The second one was, again, a Sweden player on the edge of the box, just no one anywhere near him, not getting closed down anywhere near quick enough. And then Fidor Kuchliashov just sticks out a lazy leg, one of those those lazy little blocks that a defender likes to do where he's not really doing anything or the other and just tries to get his body in the way and does nothing. And then... They uh, obviously flew into the back of the net. And that was just before, uh, just after Christopher Olsen of Krasnodar was also introduced to the game. And then right in the last minute, Sanya Sobolev grabbed a late consolation for the, for, the, for the hosts. So Russia, moving on, sit atop the Nations League group, which is, of course, the next two games. They've got maximum points so far. They've scored six goals at home to Serbia and away at Hungary. And without three of the most talented attacking players in Alexander Golovin, Alexei Maranchuk and Denis Cheryshev. But the latter is back. He came on today against Sweden. Andrew, do you think Russia are stronger with Cheryshev back in the fold? Well, I suppose in theory you'd say yes because he has experience and he clearly feels comfortable within the group. 
I, I'm not entirely sure what direction Chichesov's going in, though. Um, well, I mean, I am. I can see he's going backwards, basically, or standing still, which is going backwards in international football. The you know he sticks with too many familiar players. I think Chichesov, uh, um, um, Cherishev, sorry, is worth keeping in the squad, obviously, because he does have talent and he offers a winger's role, which we don't actually have a lot of out-and-out wingers, so he does offer a different option. Um, personally, I don't think he should get in the, fir- the full side if everybody is fit, but in the squad, absolutely, he, he, he's worth his place. Um, personally, I just simply wouldn't start him, that's all. Yeah, absolutely, I, I agree with that. I think that this, there's a few little things here that need to be unpacked, and that Cherishev is involved because he clearly has talent, but he's injury prone. On the flip side of that, I don't think he shows anywhere near enough consistency. I agree. Let's have him in the squad because of that ability to make something happen. But I genuinely think he's been living on reputation now for two years. He had a brilliant World Cup and he plays in Spain. And because of that, it seems to be that he's baked up all the time. And then 90% of games he's, he's anonymous in, to be frank. But anyway, moving a bit further forward, Artyom Zuba is just four goals behind Sasha Kurzakov and becoming Russia's all-time leading scorer. He's now scored a brilliant 26 and 44 games. And it's getting close in less than half the games played, with Kurzakov's 30 coming from 91 appearances for, this, for the Russian national team. So, Andrew, back again. Do you think that Zuba could beat him in this international break, or will it take a bit longer? Ah, so it's a close one, really. Uh, I think it's inevitable that he will eventually. I think possibly, possibly not. And the only reason I say that is because, well, because of Chichesov, he's he's, a, he's too conservative for my liking. Um, I mean, I think it's something that matters to Zuba, whether he admits it or not. He does like the acclaim. He likes the attention. And I don't think there's anything particularly wrong with that when you're a striker, and especially when you're one that feeds off emotion. We've spoken about this before, haven't we? How, you know, when he had that loan spell at Arsenal Tula ahead of the World Cup, and he, uh, what was it, he paid, a, he paid a fee so that he could play against the Leeds and scored. And you could see how much it matters to him. And I, I think this, I think, you know, feeding an ego... You can do it for some players, not every player in the team, but he is the clear leader. He's the emotional focal point of the team. Um, will he do it in this international break? Uh, he could well do. Um, I, but I think now that there is the advantage for Russia having won the first two games, and I think arguably got one of the hardest games out of the way against Serbia, uh, I think Chichasov will reverse type and will play less expansive football, which in theory should mean fewer chances. But you never know. Um, I think by the end of this international season, so by the time the Nations League is finished, I think he probably will. Yeah, definitely. And if we'll move on from Zuba here, but if anyone would like to to have a little bit, a listen to a little bit more of an in depth discussion of Artyom Zuba's time for the for Sponaya and of late and and how he's developed the player that he is today, I would recommend catching the latest uh, whatever this is podcast over. With which myself and David Sanson appeared on, with Hanu, of course, doing an excellent hosting job as always. You can find that retweeted on the RFN Twitter page earlier this morning. And in that, in that we, we go in depth on Zuba, his transformation from the sidelines at Spartak, going on loan to Rostov, and then side, going to Zenit to become the main man, once again pushed out the sidelines, and then he himself barges back in and becomes the main man for Zenit and for Russia. And then we go into a little bit of an investigation and a bit of a joke about Verazdat Haroyan and, and his apparent not actually going to war and so on. But anyway, back at the RFN podcast, boys, it's time for some predictions. So this time I think we'll bypass some score lines, but just how do you think Russia will fare in general against Turkey and Hungary? The results maybe for each is in just a win, lose, a draw. And Richard, what do you think? I think because they're playing both the games at home, I'll keep it short and simple. I'll go for a one-goal margin of victory for Sporna in both games because they're playing at home. And Andrew? Yeah, I'd go along for that. I don't think it'll be thrilling, but I do think they'll win both games. Uh, and that's all they need to do, just do the job. And I think they will do it. 
Yeah, certainly. I, I agree. I, I mean, look, it's Chichi itself. It's never thrilling, to be frank. And today's game is, is, is <laughs> probably a blueprint of what the next two could be in that it's both teams were defensively solid for large parts. And then because the defenders that Russia had on had that brain fart and, and just committed defensive suicide. But look, Sweden are one of Russia's bogey teams. They've only played each other seven times and Sweden have have become undefeated in five of those games. So not a, not the best of barometers for the Nations League games anyway with the squad that was played as well. But next up is the, the addition of the new new feature to the podcast. Now, this is actually an old site feature from way back when, from, from when a lot of the guys weren't even writing for RFN, where we used to have the, the RFN mailbag in which former editor-in-chief, the great Dane Toka Thielade, would, would answer their readers' questions every week. And, and now we're obviously 21st century, we're, we're modern, we're newer, it's listeners' questions instead. So back again is the RFN mailbag. Now, of course, this morning I tweeted out asking for some questions and we got a fantastic response the first time of asking. So big thanks first for everyone who reached out. And as always, thank you to everyone now who listens every week. It's, without you, we couldn't be here discussing what we love. And the first question was from at Danny underscore Y. And it was for Richard. So Dino yeah. Moscow search for a new manager. How is that going? Well, there's been a big development today, actually, just after that uh, question was put to us. There's been a big development today. According to uh, Champion Act, um, there are two main candidates for the job, apparently. The first one is a face that everybody on RFN is familiar with. It's Kerman Berdiev, of course, he, you know, the former Ruben Kazan and Rostov manager. Um, and the second one is a name people might not be so familiar with, and that's Sandro Schwartz, who... Um, between 2017 and 2019, coached uh, FSB Mainz in Germany. Now, apparently, according to the article on Championat, uh, Berdev is the favourite uh, for the job. Um, so we'll have to see how that one goes. Looking at it from my point of view, I think this is a classic case of the um, the hierarchy at Dynamo wanting one candidate, Berdev, and the sporting director, Dinamo, Zelko Buvac, wanting another candidate, um, Schwartz. So this could be quite interesting. Berdeev is the favourite at the minute. Um, that could change. Um, and yeah, we'll just have to wait and see how it goes. But it um, be very interesting to see what happens. Maybe they might not announce Berdeev yet, maybe to try and flush another name out. But um, Berdeev apparently is the favourite out of the two of them that have been mentioned. Yeah, I must say that if, if Dinamo decided to go Berdiev, it would be a thoroughly disappointing, in, in my mind, a, a pretty terrible appointment. I mean, all respect to Kerban Berdiev for the work he's done in the past. But look, this is if they go for another defensive coach who limits the players and the calibre of squad they have, then they're just restarting their issues from scratch again. Now, yeah, I totally agree with that. I totally agree with that because, like, I watched them against Krasnodar and they play an expansive football, play a nice attacking football. So, do you really want to go back to, you know, Turgid, defensive football, I'm not convinced that 67 is his best years behind him, Berdiev. I'm beginning to wonder that myself. Maybe um, yeah. Schwartz is a better pick, but this is this is obviously the management. Yeah, certainly. I think it's it, it's a little bit like the Tedesco case, where the old Spartak people in charge wanted to chase off. Thomas Zorn wanted Tedesco. Zorn won that battle in Fadoon's eyes, and then ironically was himself sacked while Tedesco wasn't later on, but yeah, so if we move on to question two, and that's from at Petrosian Tay on Twitter, and it was, um, why are players from certain non-Russian nations not classed as foreign players? So I'll just quickly take that one myself. And it's it's quite simple, really. And going back a little short trip to the past, it began in February 2019, when the RFU announced that Belarusian players would no longer count as legionnaires. And then in December, this is the same year, the Ministry of Sport devised the following to accommodate clubs and that's the athletes footballers from countries who are members of the Eurasian Economic Union the EAEU would not also be considered as foreigners and that includes already players in Belarus and as well as in December Kazakhstanis Armenians and Kyrgyzstanis and thus there's been quite a large influx of players from these nations in recent years and it's an attempt for the clubs to easier circumvent the 8 plus 17 squad limit. And in that, only eight foreigners can be listed in any team squad. And that was new for 2021, replacing the old uh, 6 plus 5 on-pitch limit. Uh, players like Bayer Bakhtiar Zinutinov, Farastat Haroyan, uh, Ilya Shkurin, um, Ilya Kavalyov, it's Arsene Tula, 
have all came in from these countries and now basically for all essential purposes count as Russians, uh, according to squad limits. Uh, Moldova and Uzbekistan also hold what's called observer status in the EAEU, but as of yet, they're not in actuality members of the Union. And then also Georgia has also guaranteed a, a free transit corridor, I believe it is. It's a, a, a free trade, basically, between Russia and Georgia. And have exp- all three of these states have expressed interest in being added to the EAEU. So you could see Uzbekistanis, which would have included former Rostov player Eldar Shomorodov, uh, Moldovans like the uh, Alexandru Gatskan and Georgians, like of course Kvisha himself, could theoretically one day become part of this and become Russians and, in, in theory as well. Uh, though that, this doesn't mean that they can play for Russia, of course, it just means from the squad level point of view. And it, it's it's basically just like boiling it down that <sighs> the aim is to help sides deal with the new limit, which in fine is fine in reality. It's a bit of a good move to help them deal with this limit. But in reality, what they need is a complete removal of the limit. That's the real answer to the problem. But anyway, that's that's why this is the EAU. Uh, the third question, which is presumably you would think is for Andrew, <laughs> and it comes from RFN's own David Sanson, which is with two men top of the league and two games in hand, how will they bottle it this year? <laughs> <laughs> well, if they were to bottle it, then they uh, would bring back Goran Alexic, uh, who was a good manager, but just really not well liked at the club. Um, we got Ivan Menchikov in. I haven't been able to see any games because they've not allowed any fans at all. We mentioned about the 50% fans allowed in, in Moscow. No fans at all allowed in the PFL because we've had a lot of our own problems with COVID cases. Um, Zeny Tujevsk or one of them. Um, but we beaten them away last weekend, won again tonight. And uh, I have to be honest, not only are they winning, but they're not even using some of their most dangerous attacking players. So what on earth David is smoking? It must be um, it must be something fairly strong and powerful and probably sourced from Amsterdam, I think, when he asked that question. <laughs> well, it wouldn't be two men without bottling it now and again. Like They, they are the, the famous <laughs> oh, of Russia. Now, now and again is fair enough, but we've we've done enough bottling to last us about three decades worth in the last few years. So um, enough of that. We're not bottling it anymore. Yeah. <laughs> everything is all on the up now for two men, of course, with the the recent financial settlement all all agreed, and, and of course last year, Andrew. Oh yes, yes, that was that was not a pleasant moment. And in fact, I mentioned Zenit Ishevsk. It was actually on when we played Zenit Ishevsk away uh, last season. That was when we had we were, we were given our third recurring six-point deduction from refusing to pay the cash fine. And and it honestly looked like at one point I was deadly fearful of Chumen going out of mm-hmm. professional football, which has happened before in the last 20 years. But fortunately, that's yeah. passed. We've paid. We're OK. Yeah, good. You never want any club to, to cease to exist, no matter if they are as irrelevant as Amcar PM. Now, the question number four comes from Hanu, also RFN zone. <laughs> <laughs> so, would you rather have a team of 11 Adairs or a team with Messi and Ted Rostov under 17s, Richard? Oh, God. <laughs> oh, what a way to put me on the spot, eh? Oh, Jesus. Um, it's a difficult one to answer this because when you think about it, we all saw what happened last year when Rostov had to play the youth team against Sochi because Sochi won postpone the match after the COVID tests and, and you could just tell when you know when you're dealing with like you know young players a whole team of young players you can tell when they're playing against seasoned professionals at any level of football that it's you know any country that you know the seasoned professionals are just going to be so much quicker to the ball when they play it faster the, the youngsters you know just can't can't live with them um, although when they've got um, a certain chap called Leo Messi on their side. <laughs> um, that's a good um, equalising um, factor, isn't it? Ah, oh, this is a really tough one, isn't it? Because um, we all know that Edda is just absolutely garbage <laughs> for locomotive. Mm. Um, you know, he, he really just adds nothing to the attack at all. Um, but um... go on, I'll side with us. <laughs> He hasn't actually been as bad in the last couple of weeks, Edda. He, he's still not great, of course, but he hasn't actually been bad. I'm still going to go with experience to go with 11 Edda's because, OK, you can have Messi, but if he, the other 10 supporting cast are just young, then they're going to get 
knocked around and bullied off the ball, then <laughs> I don't see. Yeah, <laughs> I just don't see how they could compete. So I'll go with I will go with eleven Adairs, but it's a difficult. <laughs> See, eleven a days, you do have a distinct physical advantage as well because That's true. if you've got if you've got eleven a days, well not even just because he's massive, but if there's eleven a days playing on the pitch, a day is a donkey, so that's twenty two legs that can kick the ball. Times and then there's the extra two because donkeys have got four legs. So it's actually forty four <laughs> legs that you can kick the ball with because he is such a donkey. Now <laughs> One in ten will be on target, but when you've got that many legs to be able to kick a ball, surely one in ten is fine. It's just, just one mathematics. You know what? You know what? This question reminds me of, guys. I don't know if you remember, Barry. Yeah. It must have been ten, fifteen years ago. There was that video doing the rounds where, the, I think it was um, Nakamura, Shinsuke Nakamura, um, and Shinji yeah. Kagawa and someone else playing against a hundred Japanese school kids, and they still beat them anyway. I, I'm trying to work out which ones are <laughs> Ede and which ones are Messi, because you, know, you could say eleven Ede is, is like the Japanese school kids, and and Messi and the Rostov kids are. are I, 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 it's very confusing. But one way or the other, I think um, I would go with Messi and the Rostov kids. I just think it'd be fun. In, in here, I will I will uh, promote once again the whatever this is podcast. Everyone, go and listen because. Hanu has set up a brilliant, instead of a Hall of Fame, he's got the Hall of Meme, in which the most meme players to ever play in the RPL need to be memorialised in the Hall of Meme. And of course, Adair is already in there. He was one of the first names to be mentioned. <laughs> so move on for, from another question, which came in through the RFN DMs, and that was from at Morris Mogg. That's familiar. Uh, Vadim Yevseyev has been sacked as Ufa boss. And what are your thoughts on this? So I'll, I'll, myself, I'll quickly just quick take this one and that. I think it's been coming for a while. Uh, Yevseyev himself has done fine at UFA. Nothing more, nothing less, really. Uh, yes, they've went backwards quite a bit and devolved and stagnated a lot, but following in Semak and Goncharenka's footsteps would always be difficult at the best of times. And look, let's be frank, right now is not the best of times for UFA. Uh, Shamil Kazizov's departure has rocked them a little bit, and it's only going to get worse in the long term with the sporting director's work generally done in the long term. Uh, they're struggling financially with Ufa, one of those clubs who have taken a particular hit from the difficulty during the lockdown and COVID-19. And thus, the transfer window has been an unmitigated disaster. They've lost Vermeen, Urinov, Nelchari, Krugovoy, and have not adequately replaced the vast majority of them. The sturdy defence is evaporating a result of these losses, and they rely far too much on Alexander Velinov in goal. I mean, look, relegation beckons if they don't improve. They are second bottom, and they are the second worst side in the league right now, even worse than Kimki. Now, Gevsey have had very little control over the transfers and how the team plays, that's all top-down. But he still lines his side far too defensively in the name to balance that lack of quality. But look, it wouldn't take a very good... Gevsey is not a very good manager, he's, like I say, he's fine. But even a very good manager probably wouldn't be able to save Ufa right now, take like Gandalf or Saruman. But... I feel sorry for him, but in the end, he had to go. It's a logical move. Ufa's problems are much bigger and are farther, farther up than the head coach's door. Whether or not bringing Ole Kononov in is going to solve that, but in the short term, if they can give them a better managerial bounce than what um, Cherochenko at Kimki, then that's all they need to do. All they need to do is survive and save themselves in a playoff. So if you want to come in on this one quickly, Richard. Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it, I, I think the departure of Gazizov has really, really affected them. Um, it's almost like in the past they've been able to, you know, when they've sold key players before, like, you know, um, Daniel Fomin, when they've sold uh, Alexander Zinchenko, when they've sold key players before, it's almost as if, you know, that's just replaced the spur part on a car, like recharging the battery, etc. But mm. Gazizov going was, is literally ripping the engine out. I think he, I think it's beginning to show you now that that was his pet project. And you know, when you take the master out of that pet project, it's all just coming down now. So they're in for a really struggling season because they're looking pretty toothless up front and they're conceding a lot of goals, Arufa. So I think tough times could be ahead. It's going to be touch and go whether they survive this season, I've got to say. Yeah, I really enjoyed that metaphor. I think that's was, was a really great way of putting it. It's it's just one step too far. It's the the lead the leader of this. I mean, Ufa have been a small club, basically pushing above their weight of late, and and as a result of that, they now fit in the RPL. They are now found their level, but financially they struggle. And 
I'm just not sure how long they can keep that up without the genius that is Shamil because he's off at the helm. And then I want to move on to question six, which is from uh, at Brockhart F as Frederick Brockhart. Um, why did Krasnodar not buy a top striker for the Champions League? Do you want to tackle that one, Andrew? Uh, yeah, I think it, it's a good question, to be fair, because you you look at Zanit and they strengthened well, I, must say, I, I think, almost over the top in midfield, bringing in Wendell and re-signing Dalek because I have two contracts. And you look at Krasnodar's um, squad and Yevgeny Markov is not exactly a Champions League not exactly a Russian Premier League standard striker, we're being brutally honest. Um, I think actually the answer lies in the fact that I don't think they feel they need to bring in a first line striker. They do see Marcus Berg as the focal point. He does have a lot of experience. He's not a flashy striker, but he will do a simple job and create a focal point for some extremely quick, exciting attacking players and wingers. Uh, you know, the likes of Victor Klaassen and Wons and. Um, and Remy Cabrera, of course. So it doesn't. It looks like they've missed out, but I'm not entirely sure what they could have brought in on the budget that Galitsky runs with them because he doesn't like to splash cash unless he gets a, a player they really need. And and how? What will a slightly better striker get them? Are, are they really hoping of getting out of the group? I mean, you've got to try. I know, but realistically, will they expect it? I, I think sticking with what they've got although it doesn't sound exciting, is probably actually not the worst idea because Marcus Berg has been there and scored a lot in the past and you never know. Just give him chances, he'll score two or three of them. Yeah, certainly. Richard, what do you think? Yeah, just to come in again, guys, um, I saw them being linked in a day with um, a striker um, in the second Bundesliga from Jan Regensburg, I think, uh, an Armenian striker. So obviously he wouldn't count on the following quota. And um, and those uh, two words at the end there are what um, I think are causing Krasnodar this problem. I think the following quote, because they are actually at the eight uh, foreigner limit. Um, and that's that could be as long as I'd Andrew's point about not necessarily needing a striker. I think the foreign limit possibly, possibly as well is a hindrance to them here. Yeah, certainly. Um, I don't think they would be able to bring that guy in anyway with the international uh, window closed now. It would have to be domestic only, unfortunately. So oh, Of course, yeah. yeah I'd forgotten unless that. they bring in a foreign player from within Russia and then can perhaps ship Olsen or Ramirez or one of the foreigners that could be deemed surplus to requirement, don't get us wrong, most of their foreigners are first team players, but one of the le- more surplus to requirements than others, then there's not really much out there. And if they can't do that, is there any Russians that are probably better than what they have right now for Europe? Now they could bring in Markov like they did, but Markov's not for Europe, he's for the games after Europe. You have Geni Lutsenka, they could bring him in, but once again, would he really make that much of a difference in the Champions League games. He's better than Markov, but for European games particularly, it was just a difficult one for Krasnodar, where once again, this limit is more difficult to navigate than one would first expect uh, uh, when it first came in. But if we'll move on to question seven, just from at, oh, I'm going to murder this one. At G I U P S fifty eight. Sorry, I, I I'm terrible at pronunciations for trying to get that one out. But what's happening in Rostov now, Richard? I presume that's not day to day. What's going on in Rostov's uh, high street market? But what's going on with <laughs> why they're performing so poorly? Yeah, um, it's an interesting one, and I think we've touched a bit on it on a few uh, past pods, haven't we? That um, you know, last season they only finished fifth because they had a brilliant run of form three Christmas. Aldo Shmurov was scoring goals uh, and in good form. And then they were obviously affected by a lot of things post-winter um, break. Shmurov lost his form. Also, they were affected by the COVID situation. They had to, you know, field, um, you know, memorably that 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 youth team against Sochi when they took a, a 10-1 hammering. And uh, they ended up basically last year getting fifth by default. So I just think we saw, uh, we're sorry, we've lost off. This is just a, a drop to a more natural level. Um, it's worth remembering that I think they've been elevated thanks to that brilliant season they had in 2015-16 under Kerman Badev when they nearly won the league. And they would have been, you know, you could have called them Russia's champion of hearts that season, couldn't you? Because everybody apart from Siska fans was wanting them to win the league. You know, every big club was 
when they were well at the title race was cheering for Rostock to win the league. It would have been, you know, Russia, uh, the RPL's Leicester City moment. Um, and I think now it's just a case of simply Rostock are just coming back down to their natural level. They've overperformed for a long time. Um, and I think I think people have just got to accept that now that they've overperformed their level and they're probably a mid-table team. Um, and financially, they probably might have been hit by the pandemic as well. I think, yeah, I think it's just, you know, Rostov had that couple of good seasons in the spotlight where they perform well, they've been they've been run superbly well, but eventually after a while, if you're not one of the elite level teams and you're not well backed, then it, it catches up with you. So I think it's just more a case of Rostov dropping down to a more natural level. I, I don't think they're in any kind of uh, relegation danger or anything like that, but they'll probably just drop back to mid-table mid for a couple of seasons now, which is still a good position for a club their size. Yeah, certainly. And the next one from the same guy on Twitter, same question. It was a little bit of a cheeky one. It was two in one, but more than happy to accommodate. And that was, uh, is Luch Vladivostok still alive in the lower divisions? And I, I'd laugh at Luch, but I, I don't want to because it's a bit, it's, it's sad what's happened. But still alive is just a great way of putting it. I found it quite funny. And uh, Luch's issues have been long documented. They're peren- they were perennially stuck in the thin L for years due to the pay for elite clubs continually refusing to, due, to refuse promotion due to lack of fit finances. Uh, for, for a couple of years in a row, uh, Cheetah finished top, Sakhalin finished top, but both refused to uh, get promotion into the Finna L because the size of the league, the geographic cost, the, the travel cost, it's crazy. Um, and in the past, funding was so bad at one point at Luch in particular that the fans actually organised numerous food collections for players and who couldn't even afford to feed the families because they were continually not getting paid by the club. Um, the, the 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 fans would basically have collections in the streets and then take it all back to the literally the middle of the pitch in in the Dinamo Stadium in, in Vladivostok and would hand it out to the players. It's it's like a food bank, but for professional footballers, it's it's quite unfathomable from from an English perspective anyway that that would happen to a professional footballer, but. Uh, this year, Irtic Omsk were finally promoted to the Finna L, but unfortunately it actually came a bit too late for Luch. Um, Irtic accepted promotion, so Luch would ordinarily have lined up in what was the PFL East, but that was of course in the summer disbanded in the, in the PFL reforms that was carried out by the RFS. And um, The other clubs from the PFL East were amalgamated into what is now a four-division professional football league. And then on the 1st of April 2020, in in the midst of the pandemic, uh, the the full first lockdown, the government of the Prim, Primorsky Krai actually announced that uh, professional contracts with all clubs, sports clubs in the region, would be cancelled in order to provide funds to combat the spread of COVID-19 in the Primorsky Krai in southeast Russia, uh, far south, far, far east Russia. Um, and Luch then, of course, dropped to the Russian Amateur Football League, which is dubbed as the third division. Um, now, Luch's executive director, uh, Yevgeny Switchenko, did confirm that Luch would have a team in the Amateur Third League for what is now this season. And he was, I found a quote, he was quoted in saying that next year, Luch will play in the third division. Uh, whether Luch will be able to return to the professional status in a year will depend upon the financial situation. So that was in April. Uh, basically confirming that next season, which is the current season, they would be playing amateur football and could actually become professional again the year following year. Now, Luch could only survive with the regional government funding their losses and as soon as uh, relegation to the amateur league was inevitable once this was pulled. But in spite of all of these claims of potential becoming a club again, Luch have actually still not played a single game in the amateur league and it's now... 13 games into the season out of 18 in Siberia. So there's literally no word on whether Luch are actually playing or not right now. The the Facebooks went dark, the Twitters went dark, the Von Katkas went dark. They are the websites now website now just brings you to a bizarre advert. So uh, to be quite honest, in the immediate future it's 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 very questionable. But the theory was anyway, they would drop down the amateur leagues, uh, get a little bit of funding back together hope for the pandemic to be swept over quite quickly and then work the way back up. So are they still alive? Right now, it looks like no, but hopefully the, there can be some faith in the future for them to come back. Uh, so the next question is from at the Ben Zenit. 
uh, are there any major changes to be made to the layout of the RPL and Finitel? Has there been any talk? There has been talk of having extra all S teams in the past. Uh, Andrew, do you want to take that one? Uh, yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting question because I think we've all mentioned the potential uh, plans for restructuring the Russian league system, which I do think needs to happen at some point. Um, realistically, no, uh, to answer shortly. There was talk, of course, of the Premier League being expanded to 18 teams, which <laughs> was, it's just ludicrous when you think that with 16 yeah. teams, there is almost every year one club that either struggles to even complete games like Tom Tomsk when when I believe Alexander Soblik was on loan there. Um, was it three seasons ago? I think it was four seasons. And they had to yeah. pretty much fill a youth team for the second half of the season. Um, it, if you can't support 16 teams consistently, regularly over time, how on earth will you support 18? How will the fixtures fit in? So, in short, no. Um, the fun ale itself, well, I think the the most interesting part of this level of the pyramid is actually what's happening below it with the PFL. Like you mentioned, four groups instead of five regional divisions, the problematic East division is now disbanded and and teams are having to base themselves further west. Uh, what it means in terms of the uh, of the Fennel is we have uh, 22 teams, I think, this season um, at the moment. Um, and I don't think we're likely to see much change until we see some sort of consistency with the number of teams and divisions in which they play in the third tier below them. Um, there's no point expanding it if you're not going to have enough teams to regularly come up. So basically, no. Um, but talks have been had. I don't think we're going to see much movement in the near future. Yeah, me either. The old pessimistic point of view rises back again. Yeah, me and then agree. <laughs> another one from out of the Ben Zenit, and that's uh, our opinion on the new foreign element and how that's going so far. I'll, I'll quickly take this one. And that At first, I thought, to be honest, it was an improvement. I thought it allowed clubs more freedom on a match-to-match basis, uh, not having to put a certain amount of foreign, uh, Russian sorry, into a team on a match-day basis should be a lot more difficult than having a certain amount of for foreigners in the squad for a year. But it is still a massive hurdle. The, the, the number is far too small. It's limiting each side and it's causing stockpiling of players, young Russian players being stockpiled at these big clubs and aren't getting enough football. I mean, Ayaz Guliev and Alexander Tashayev are still at Spartak. When was last time either of them actually played for Spartak? Uh, we'll, look, we'll have, to, we'll have to wait and see on the longer term impact. It's a little bit too early to tell, of course, as you yourself would know, Ben. It's not really the squad limit which would cause an uneven stack of players, like a match day limit would, where you would have 15 very good Russian goalkeepers and 15 very good Russian defensive midfielders, whereas every single right winger and right back was out of crap, for which we did have for a little while. Uh, not just those positions, just power of, uh, speculating, of course. But at a national level, we'll have to wait and see. But at least we are now seeing a few foreign goalkeepers for the first time, or feels like an age. Um, the only real barometer, in my opinion, in the short term is Europe and how Russian teams perform in Europe. Obviously, this early stage, now the, the squad limit forces the top RPL clubs to limit the amount of foreigners. And thus, they simply do not have the quality to compete at the European level. Uh, Dinamo and Rostov have already lost to Minos and are out of the Europa League entirely before they even got to the group stages. And the rest have all got difficult groups in their respective competitions. I mean, look, the difficult groups will happen every year. It's Russia. The every other raw like Tottenham, who's in pot three or whatever, we'll see as Zenit is the team they want to get in pot one, or Loco is the team they want to get in pot one ahead of a Juve or an Atletico or a Barca. Of course they will. That's just how the world works, how football works. But the if the RFU is serious about the development of the RPL and our clubs in Europe, the limit just absolutely needs to be scrapped. It causes an unnecessary headache. And the limit in general is the chief cause of why Russia has fell back below Portugal in the coefficients. So it's early to tell, but still not good because it exists. Richard, do you have much feelings on the new foreigner limit? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think, whilst it's an improvement on the previous six, I think I still think eight. You know, I, 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 I'm with you guys. I think really the limit should be scrapped completely. 
I think 10 would have been a good compromise if they if it allowed 10 and 15. And there was all that talk um, about 10 plus 15 amongst um, our Facebook chat, hasn't there? Where if you have got to have a, if you are going to have to have a limit, have 10 foreigners and 15 uh, domestic players. Um, and I did actually read somewhere that um, you know 10 15 would give more variation, wouldn't it? You could you could then have two or three decent quality foreign players on the bench. You wouldn't have to sell them. You know you wouldn't have to have clubs sacrificing players because you're still giving up squad depth by having to do that. There might be some good foreign players you can keep on your bench with a 10 plus 15 idea. And I think I did read somewhere that. You know, the ironic thing is, is the clubs have been a bit like Oliver Twist this year, haven't they? They've got more from the RFU and now they're going back to them saying, can I have some more, please? And I actually read somewhere, I think the big clubs have lobbied, I think it was something for like 11 in the squad. Apparently that's what they wanted. I don't know which big clubs it were, but I definitely saw there was some of the big clubs who yeah. wanted 11. So let's see if anything develops on that front. I think 10, I mean, I prefer no limit, but 10 plus 15 would have been an acceptable compromise. I remember an interview with Leonard Fadoon at the time, and if I remember it rightly, I might be misremembering it, but if I do recall rightly, I believe that 11 was the average of foreigners who were at the club. So the, if you averaged out how many foreigners each club had when the limit was new limit was uh, being discussed, 11 would have been the, the league average. Ah, so so it, it would have been a, a fair compromise to get to. Now, Rostov at the time had 15 foreigners in their squad. Wow. Uh, <laughs> Being either out on loan or playing regularly week in, week out. Obviously, Rostov's famously very good at scouting the Scandinavian market, the Asian market very well. So when that was announced, they had 15 foreigners. I get rid of half the foreigners in their squad. It was just absolutely wild. Um, but once again, this is it, it's, it's, it, it's unfathomable that the RFU don't see the foreigner limit as the issue. In 2017-18, they naturalised... Mario Fernandez, Guilherme and Ari uh, and Roman Neustadter because they needed more people in their positions because the stockpiling and the stacking of positional play during because of the foreign limit, they identified there was an issue then, but they still couldn't identify that the limit was the root cause. So they brought in that, but even though they brought in naturalization, which did help, Mario Fernandez was brilliant at the World Cup and has been ever since and was before then. Right now, they are having the squad limit, and to rectify some of the issues that that has brought in, they've brought in another different thing where legionnaires, players from the EAEU, aren't legionnaires. Well, why don't you stop sticking plasters on the issues and actually get to the core of the problem and get rid of the limit? 100%. Everybody knows that that's the issue. So, eh, they are a few useless, we all know that. But there's one final question from at Logo Sokol, which uh, I'm not too sure about who this fella is. Eh? At Logo Sokol, and surely not a certain local writer for RFN, Ilya Sokolov. <laughs> but uh, anyway, he asks once again, Andrew specifically, what his thoughts <laughs> are on... Thoughts you might. <laughs> what his thoughts <laughs> are on Logo's chances in the Champions League final this year. So, Andrew, Logo going to win the Champions League? This is going to be the most satisfying answer I'll ever give to a mobile question. I can actually genuinely say, without even being sarcastic, two men have a better chance of winning the Champions League than Lokomotiv do because they actually are in the Champions League semi-final. You didn't think I was going to let this whole podcast pass without referencing that, did you guys? Um, and in case you are <laughs> confused as to who two men even are, yet alone why am I making up nonsense about them being in the Champions League final, I am not lying. The UEFA Champions League semi-final tomorrow... Chumen against Murcia, um, which of course Chumen will win because they're the greatest futsal team in the world. And then they'll beat Barcelona in the final on Sunday. And then I can say to Ilya, Ilya, I know what it's like to win the Champions League. You don't. So, you know, that's all I've got to say on that matter. <laughs> hopefully, if they do win it, hopefully. Hopefully, but... hopefully. No hope about it. It's in the bag. <laughs> <laughs> Nevertheless, they've got a better chance of, lo of of local winning it because, look, let's be real, local are dead in the water in the group stages. <laughs> but anyway, if you want to want to feature in the next RFN mailbag, just uh, drop us a DM on Twitter. Uh, reply to our what's going to be a, every time we do a mailbag feature, I'll be post ahead asking you for questions or just drop us an email at russianfootballnews1 at gmail.com and we'll get through all of your responses, be it in this week's episode, next week's or whatever. We'll add We've got a long list of everyone's responses. And uh, once again, the email is russianfootballnews1 at gmail.com.
So with that, that last question means that it's the end of this week's episode of the RFN podcast. So if you want to check out the website, as always, at RussianFootballNews.com. And as I've mentioned, of course, Russia take over this weekend, facing Turkey and Hungary, respectively, in the Nations League. If you want a, f- a domestic football fix, the entirety of the Finna L are playing tomorrow, uh, on Friday. And then on Saturday, there is a, a regular uh, selection of pay for L games, which will, will all be found live on SportRex. Uh, and there's one last little bit of news. In the Guardian's annual Next Generation list of talents, uh, Dinamo Moscow central midfielder Arsen Zakayan has been listed. Uh, he follows in the footsteps of Kirill Kol- Kolesnichenko, uh, Ilya Martinov, who were listed in 2017, Daniel Utkin from 2016, uh, Artyom Gladshan from 2015, and then obviously Timur Jamaletinov from the first issue in 2014. So, Richard, where can everyone find yourself online? You can find me at, at RichDPike89, at RichDPike89 on Twitter. And I also write for um, Heart of Football as well. Andrew? Uh, yeah, I'm on Twitter at Andrew M I J Flint, and you will definitely be seeing a lot of references to Jumen and Champions League. In case you didn't quite catch it in the last few minutes, um, over the next few days, so follow me for coverage of that. <laughs> this has been the RFN podcast. Das wird dann ja doch Веди его, беги, точнее его удар Но мяч берет на нерешительный вратарь Не напрасно футбольное поле Самых ловких и смелых плечов Здесь нужны тренировка и воля Быстрота, увлечение, расчет